as an artist with Palestinian heritage, I would like to, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, 80, I'm 88 now, I'll be 89 in, in July. I'm thinking about, you know, <laughs> there's going to have to be an obituary about me. Um, what, what would it say? What would I want it to say? Well, I wanted to say that, that I worked real hard trying to give a voice for a people without a voice and doing that through my art, a peaceful way of expressing what's really happening in the Middle East. <laughs> My name is Raji Cook. I'm a Palestinian American. Now, Cook sounds non Palestinian, but my family name was actually Suleiman. And the, uh, when the British came in and took over the territory from the Turks, who called my grandfather Kujuk, my grandfather was a small man. And uh, Kujuk means small, I believe, in, uh, in Turkish. But when the British came and ex sort of expelled, you might say, the, uh, the Turks, they confronted my grandfather and asked him, what's your name? And he said, Kujuk. They said, no, that's a bad name. That's Turkish. Your name is Cook. Well, my family name was originally Suleiman. So my name, my family name, was taken away from us. My mom and dad came from Ramallah in 1927. My, my dad made a, several trips back and forth from America to Ramallah, but I'm one of them married my mom. Her name was Jalila. Her last name was Tota, Jalila Tota. Um, but after they, they married, they came to America in the year 1927. Shortly afterwards, I was born in 1930. And subsequently, my parents had uh, uh, another daughter and then a son, another daughter and another son. When I was in high school, my junior year, 1946-47, my dad asked me, what did I want to do with my life? And you know, and most Palestinians and most immigrants, they come to America thinking that their offsprings will end up being in the medical field or law, or uh, engineering, something that would guarantee food on the table. And being uh, a, a, a person who was born in 1930, a year after the 29 crash, my dad was really concerned and uh, that I would have been able to provide food on the table for my family when I would subsequently be married. Well. I was really interested in art and I told him I wanted to go to art school. Going to art school was not uh, uh, in my dad's vocabulary. It really, uh, he didn't know too much about wh what that area of, of uh, a career, you might say, uh, would give his son, uh, and especially, as I said, during the, uh, the uh, depression in 1929, how is he going to provide food if being an artist? How could he make a living being an artist? Well, my dad did subsequently decide he was going to support me in whatever I did. He lived long enough to realize that his decision was a good one. I graduated college in 1954. 
I worked for a large advertising agency in Philadelphia, the first advertising agency in the United States. Then I was offered a job in, uh, on Madison Avenue in New York with a design firm. I subsequently, uh, after five years, decided to leave and start my own business. I had a wonderful career. My dad lived long enough to see me shake the hands of Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States. After we completed a project for the United States government and winning an award for it, a design award, only one of 13 awards given for design in America. The project it was to design a set of symbols that would assist travelers coming to America at that time approaching the bicentennial. And they were concerned, the government was concerned, that people would be able to travel freely without having uh, uh, a language they may not be totally familiar with. So these symbols was going to be a visual language, a ticket counter, baggage, ground transportation, arrivals, departures, um, luggage pickup. These are symbols that are pretty important. Men's room and ladies' room, most important. And uh, um, these symbols would have to be understood clearly uh, as a graphic image to foreigners who have no understanding of the English language. The project took us a year to do. We did about 70 symbols. As I might have indicated earlier, but I had a partner uh, that worked with me for about 30 years. This project took a full year to do. And uh, uh, it was exciting to be a, a son of an immigrant uh, developing a project that people all over the world would be using. And this started in 1974 when it was introduced to an inter international uh, conference on transportation. That's a long time ago. My father really lived long enough to uh, see that uh, my career and his uh, willingness to uh, provide an education for me was a good investment. As a designer, graphic designer, I really never thought I was working. I was, I was doing work for AT&T, IBM, uh, uh, sharing for many pharmaceutical companies. Um, uh, all, all of my clients were Fortune 500. Uh, we had no uh, sales staff. I, uh, I was a salesman. I was a designer and I had a partner who also assisted in design. I mentioned earlier, his name was Don Shinovsky. In 1981, my wife and I decided we would like to go to Palestine. I would be interested in uh, seeing a little bit and understanding and getting to know more about my roots. And uh, uh, we spent a month in the Middle East went to Egypt and uh, Jordan and Palestine. On a subsequent trip that I, I was part of for the United Presbyterian Church in 1981 or 82, um, the Presbyterian Church General Assembly decided that it would be important for all the Presbyterian churches in America to have a better understanding of what was going on in the Middle East. We uh, went to Palestine. It was an eye-opening experience for me, especially the visit to Gaza. It was the only time in my adult years that I could remember breaking down. I was totally, totally my life was totally impacted by the visit to Gaza. 
visiting refugee camps, visiting the people in those camps, seeing what was happening. I could not believe, I could not understand how a situation that was happening there could happen. Uh, I came from America. I had the freedom to do anything, most anything I wanted to do that was a law-abiding person would do. I could travel, I could, I could uh, say things that I would like to say, but uh, uh, so many things that I found in, uh, in Gaza and subsequently when we went to uh, the, the West Bank, which was called Palestine at one time, um, I found out there were things such as home demolitions, unequal distribution of water, collective punishment, uh, so many things that were so, uh, so difficult to understand that I never had to cope with. In that visit in Gaza, I actually broke down. I called my wife and I tried to explain what was happening. I called my partner. I, I was emotionally torn uh, talking to both my wife and my partner, my business partner. Getting back, leaving Gaza, we had a bus that took us there. And it was just, it was parked outside of Gaza, uh, just at the Gaza border. As I was getting on the bus, I was trying to figure out what could I do? What could I do as an artist? What could I do as a human being to share, help me share my experiences and, and, and perhaps make a difference to the people that I, was, uh, that I visited with in Gaza and the West Bank? How could I do something that might alleviate what I saw, the problems? Riding in the bus, I said, well, you're an artist. Why don't you do artwork? Well, I spent my uh, productive years working for major clients, uh, doing collateral material, annual reports, brochures, films. But is there a way that I could apply some of this experience to create an awareness to people in America and perhaps beyond about what I saw, what I experienced? with my own eyes. I was really impressed by the work of an American artist by the name of Joseph Cornell. He was uneducated in the field of art, but for somehow he ended up in doing, throughout his life, creating uh, boxes. And he would go to flea markets and, uh, and uh, basically flea markets, and he would buy objects and he would build a box out of wood and uh, put these uh, objects that he would find to express his feelings about various things. And, and being uh, impressed by that, I said, you know, I could do that. I was always handy with woodworking and uh, I said, I could make boxes. I could, uh, uh, I could express myself in a creative manner about what I've seen and what I've heard, I started doing that. I ended up uh, making about 80 boxes or more and exhibiting them at various shows. I had no problem exhibiting, but not exhibiting them in major ma uh, museums or galleries. Mostly museums were afraid to show the work because they couldn't understand how I'm sure that this sort of thing could be happening, or perhaps under pressure from uh, Jewish groups that didn't want people to understand uh, what what I was what was happening there that I was trying to express through my art. There's several projects that I did to be able to express my my feelings. So often you, we hear in America that, that uh, Israelis have been uh, uh, attacked, uh, 
and I've been been uh, shot or, or what um, that, that the Palestinians the, the thing that bothered me most the Palestinians were sort of inhuman the vicious people we only we always heard about one side of the issue here in America. Today, this is still going on. To this day, as I speak, we're only hearing one side of what's happening in the Middle East. We never hear, or very, 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 very little do we hear about what is really happening in the West Bank, in Palestine, with illegal settlements. and so. Uh, uh, a killing of Palestinian children. We only hear of the tragic situation of a child being killed that was a, a Jewish or some young fanatical Palestinian uh, went and blew his, uh, himself up in a, in a market. Uh, I, I tried to figure out, I tried to express myself through my art that uh, the Palestinians had no airplanes. They had no fighter planes. They had no uh, tanks. They had no nothing more than, in most cases, a slingshot. Whereas the, the uh, military in Israel had uh, uh, fighter planes, perhaps provided by the American government. They had tanks. These are things that I saw, uh, airplanes that have the Star of David on it, uh, tanks uh, going through Palestinian villages. Um, I wanted to express some of these things. So maybe more clearly, being what's happening could, could be more clear to uh, uh, what, what's going on there. And, uh, Doing work for major corporations in America, um, creating uh, uh, programs or developing um, brochures or film um, was very easy for me to help promote what a client was looking for or trying to do. Well, I said I could do that, and when I was doing it, I felt very comfortable. I had no problem of expressing myself. My only problem is getting my work exhibited. Um, um, my, I had a great deal of experience. I, I was a student, uh, given a, an award for a, a student who graduated Pratt Institute as being an outstanding designer in my field. I. Uh, I uh, felt very good to, to be a Palestinian and doing what I'm doing now um, uh, as clients, being my heritage, relatives who are still there. One of the projects that I did was uh, I got the names of all the children that were killed, Palestinian and Israeli children that were killed within a period of 10 years. And um, the overwhelming names, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about the project. I created a box, and the box had a list of names, both Jewish names, Israeli names, and Palestinian children's names. And in the bottom of the bottom quarter of the box was filled with spent cartridges, bullets, but spent cartridges of the kind of weapons that were used by the Israelis in the Middle East. The overwhelming names in this box, just a list, nothing more graphic than names and cartridges, but the overwhelming names by far were Palestinian children. 
Very few of their names were Israelis. Its children are dying, and the majority of them are Palestinians. There was a book, a publication put out not too long ago by the Washington Report on Middle Eastern Affairs, I believe. And it, uh, it listed for a given year the amount of deaths, children being killed on both sides. This publication is readily available and it takes day by day, every day and every month, how many children were killed and their names. But it's unbelievable. Overwhelmingly, more than 60 or 70 percent of their names were Palestinian children, young children, never having an opportunity to live as I am living in my home. I'm a collector. I collect a lot of things. And one day I was at a flea market in uh, just outside of Lamberville, Pennsylvania, very large flea market. And uh, I found something there that, that really uh, I knew right away what I wanted to do with it. Usually I, buy, I get something at the flea market. I'm not sure, but it looks kind of interesting. And perhaps I could use it in one of my boxes. But uh, I found an ammo box. And ammo boxes, uh, they come in different sizes. And uh, what they are is uh, it, it would carry, these are American boxes. They would have ammunition like uh, uh, for various size uh, weapons. And uh, uh, they would take belts. The, the ammunition is not just loose. They're in a belt that would be fed into some sort of a, a machine gun. And uh, it was khaki in color, and on the side, it gave the, uh, the uh, information on what was in the box, what caliber ammunition. I said, gee, that's interesting. And uh, I took it home. I bought one. I now have two or three more. Um, but uh, I took it home, and I said, gee, how can I help? What can help me in making... Uh, this thing expressed something that I want to say. The Palestinians are always being told that they're, they're using slingshots. Did anybody ever think a slingshot against a tank, a uh, 50 caliber machine gun, an airplane, where Palestinians are using rocks, throwing rocks, using slingshots. There are no calibers in slingshot. A slingshot is a slingshot. And it, it's, a, it's a rubber band, you might say, with a little pocket for a rock. Um, and I said, gee, I could, I could put rocks in that box that might express, this is what the, uh, this is what the Palestinian are using to defend themselves. The, 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 besides the, the rocks, we hear of suicide bombers. Can you imagine why would a person in, in their right mind uh, blow themselves up? Well, you know, people don't realize that. They don't think about the fact that they're using their body. It's, the situation is so depressing they had no weapons, they have no airplanes, they have no tanks, they have no bazookas, uh, where they're fighting a country that they're, they're being uh, colonized and attacked and, and, uh, and uh, shot at with, by airplanes and tanks and, and high caliber, sophisticated guns. Uh, and the Palestinians are using their bodies. I, I just wonder if anybody realizes, what does that mean? What does it mean? And uh, so I put rocks in that ammo box, and that was one of the first pieces I did. I actually did that 
and, uh, that w and it was exhibited in a museum in uh, Houston, Texas, the Station Museum. I made a box. I, I took the uh, ammo box that I bought that was only about uh, uh, 12 inches by 12 inches by 4 inches wide, uh, filled with uh, 25 caliber or whatever caliber that uh, would be placed in there. I, I took I took the uh, ammo box, and uh, I realized that it would be a great, great visual to show how the Palestinians are trying, desperately trying, to solve themselves, uh, solve this issue of being occupied, uh, to be free, uh, to live like I live here in America. And uh, uh, they're using rocks. They're either throwing them, using them in a slingshot. But this, this is against very sophisticated military equipment. The imbalance that one sees uh, very quickly when you visit, when you, if you had an opportunity to visit and see what's actually happening, is a total imbalance. And not only that, the world, is, well, especially where I live in America, we're not, be, we're not being told. The story is not being told. Only part of the story is being told. My father was an amazing person. Um, we lived, we had our own home in uh, Bloomfield, New Jersey. I had a lot of friends that would come to my home. And I recall my father getting up off his chair that he loved to sit on and walking to the front door, opening the front door, and he knew who was coming. I told him I'm expecting visitors. And he would put out his hand and shake the hand of a friend of mine and escort them into the living room. And I was told by many of my friends that never knew that my dad was blind. My dad never complained about the fact that he didn't have sight. I remember when I was living, uh, I was probably in the fourth or fifth grade, and uh, he had just had surgery at a hospital, an Ioneer hospital, and uh, he came home with bandages over his eyes. And, uh, the family was told at some point uh, they could remove the bandages. When they did, my dad did, still did not have sight. The operations were pretty much a failure. The medical field didn't know that much about glaucoma, which I think he had, which I don't think they understood that he had. And he had cataract, which today is a, a rather minor surgery. My dad lived as a blind person uh, all his life, uh, the greater part of his life. I never heard my dad complain once. The only things he would ask me to do uh, would help do something physical that he couldn't do. Or he would ask me to go for a walk with him, and we would walk around the block. But as I said, he never complained to me. Never complain. But he was listening. He was always listening, or frequently, I found him listening uh, to the radio. We had a radio called the Stromberg Culture. It was a floor model radio. It had short wave. And I recall frequently, my dad would be sitting by the radio, his head tilted toward the, uh, the speaker on the radio, big floor model radio. He was, I recall it, he was about 94, listening, as he usually did, hoping to hear some news about peace in the Middle East. My father lived till 95 and uh, was never able to hear the kind of news that he was hoping for. Peace in the Middle East. 
at the time when I took a picture of him, and it was a, uh, it's in my book, that I was interviewed by a correspondent who happened to be Jewish. And uh, he was uh, interviewing me uh, on a subject of a, uh, a situation that was occurring in, uh, in Westchester. Um, we were trying to have an exhibit, we developed uh, a program in a gallery, an exhibit in a gallery uh, of Palestinian art uh, done by artists in Palestine and Palestinian artists in America. And uh, we needed about $100,000 to rent the gallery. It was very expensive. So in the town of Westchester, we uh, were given a, uh, a, uh, a community center where we could sell olive oil. We could sell the hand of beautiful hand embroidery work that were done by Palestinians. There were a number of people that complained about this. They said that we were selling items to promote a, a show that was a show that was uh, promoting terrorism. The, the councilmen in Westchester got involved. Uh, they were called in to see if they could stop, he could stop this uh, raising of money for this terrorist show. Well, um, I'm driving to a meeting uh, that I had to be at, and I got a call while I was in the car. I pulled over and uh, answered the call, and it was a gentleman by the name of Peter Applebaum. He, was a, he introduced himself as a writer for the New York Times. And he asked me a lot of questions. And he said he was doing a story about the situation of a group of people raising money for a, a, uh, a show that was promoting terrorism in the Middle East. And uh, he said, could he talk to me about it? I said, certainly. And uh, we talked for about 20 minutes or more. And uh, he published an article. And the article in the New York Times was titled, Much to Do About Nothing. Hmm. Much to Do About Nothing. I was totally, I just, I was, uh, I was just so pleased with this article that he wrote. And the, uh, the writer, his name, as I said, I, his name is Peter Applebaum. He was a Jewish writer. And in the article that he wrote, the last thing, the last paragraph in the article uh, was a quote from uh, our interview. And, and it went like, if I can remember correctly, I said to him, Peter, my dad died at 94, blind, sitting next to the radio, blind, hoping to hear some good news about peace in the Middle East. I said, P Peter, I'm 71. At the time, I believe I was 71. I'm 71. I, I don't want to die hoping to hear good news about peace in the Middle East. I don't want to wait that long. I don't want to be gone from this world, planet. Well, the way Peter Applebaum ended his article was just that, saying in the article it ended with, Peter, my dad died blind sitting next to the radio, hoping to hear something good about peace in the Middle East. I'm 72 now, and I don't want to die, still hoping to hear some good news about peace in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs>